Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to talk to this wonderful conference and meet new people and reconnect with people I knew from all times. So um, I want to, um, to tell you about um, arithmetic resurgence of quantum invariance, and by that I mean quantum invariance in dimension 3, and such as not invariance or three-manifold invariance. I will actually not talk about three-manifolds so much. So as I understand, resurgence is uh, a property of formal power series and their analytic continuation and their expansion of those functions near singularities where the original uh, power series uh, emerges or resurges. Um, <coughs> so resurgence can be formulated, if you can formulate it for form power series, you can also formulate it for its Taylor coefficients, so it can be formulated for sequences themselves. So you can talk about the resurgence of the sequence n factorial, you know, for instance, which is factorially divergent, but you can do things to it. So as I understand, resurgence is abundant for functions which are defined using difference, differential, integral equations, linear or not. Um, and I also understand that there are at least two aspects of the theory, one of which is proofs and the other of which is numerical experimentation, symbolic or uh, truly numerical. And I will talk about that. Uh, that part of the theory is very fun. It's suited for uh, mathematical physics. Um, but it's only one aspect, right? Okay, so I came across resurgence in 2005 when I studied a particular question and I had an agenda in mind, namely the volume conjecture. So, um, so let me give you some um, introduction about it. So we're talking about a knot in, three sphere and to a knot there is a sequence of Laurent polynomials with integer coefficients. These are called the nth colored Jones polynomial. So for instance n equals 2 is the original Jones. So these are supposed to be polynomials defined using the representation theory of SL2 together with the n-dimensional representation and greatly generalized and so on and so forth. So one knot has a sequence of polynomials. If you wish, you can really think that the nth color Jones polynomial is basically the, the Jones polynomial of a parallel of a knot the n minus 1 parallel. That's correct up to some subleading kind of orders which are universal and depend on the knot. But there is a little theorem in this game, um, joint work with Tang Le, which says that the colored Jones polynomial, namely this sequence of polynomials, is Q-holonomic. So let me explain what this means. It means it satisfies a linear Q difference equation of the form um, CD of Q, Q to the N, J N plus D, and C zero Q, Q to the N, Jn of q. Here I drop the dependence on k. So this is true for all n, where the cj's 
are Laurent polynomials in two variables. So, in other words, it's a linear Q difference equations whose coefficients are polynomials in Q and Q to the n. But if the polynomial is Q to the n, also polynomials in Q? Not true. What polynomial of Q is Q to the 100? It's a polynomial of degree 100. All right, let's make n 200. If n is a variable, q to the n is another symbol. It's not a polynomial of q. And how's the degree of this polynomial grows in n quadratically? Or? The degree of the polynomial here. Yeah. Yes, it's also a theorem that the degree of the Kohler Jones polynomial is a quadratic quasi-polynomial. And that is actually true for all solutions of linear Q difference equations. And the only proof of that theorem, actually of myself, I wasn't planning to talk about that, uses Le Mahler scholar theorem and periodic analytic number theory. So yeah, the degree grows quadratically. <clears throat> OK, so this is a theorem and true for all knots. So. And how unique are the CJs? Sorry? How, how unique are the CJs? First of all, CD should not be zero. And uh, there is a unique way among all Q difference equations, there is a unique way to make a minimal order Q difference equation. And that makes the so-called A hat polynomial, which annihilates the color Jones. And it is a not polynomial. And, and it's an invariant itself. OK, so let us suppose that a, a linear Q difference equation, that the linear Q difference equation has a basis of solutions which are asymptotic to, so when you put Q equals e to the alpha over n, they're asymptotic to e to the whatever, s minus 1 times n, and s0 and s1 over n, and so on. OK? Let's suppose that, that a linear difference equation has such a basis of solution. Um, in fact, a resurgent with respect to 1 over n. But I don't even care about the resurgence. If that is true, then a version of the volume conjecture holds. And the volume conjecture just says that the nth color Jones polynomial of the knot evaluated at the nth root of unity grows exponentially and the rate is the volume of the knot times 2 pi i. OK, that is the volume conjecture. So the volume conjecture would follow from the previous statement and it would make a nice theorem in a fine journal. But it is not a theorem. OK? So if you really want to look at linear Q difference equations, so you can think of them as uh, Schrodinger, except that they are different, and really except that they are high order. Even the order of the equation for the figure 8 knot, the order is 3. So already you're talking about higher order, but who cares because you can make them with vector values. So, OK, so that's just one idea. I mean, even without mentioning resurgence, just that idea alone uh, doesn't exist. Or if it does, please let me know, and we can finish that sort of you know, paper. <clears throat> so let me now give an example. So among all knots, let's start with the trefoil which sometimes I can and sometimes I cannot draw. Trefoil. So there is a formula. I didn't tell you how the color Jones polynomial is defined, but it is defined in a complicated way. 
So the formula is the following, minus n sum from 0 to n minus 1, q to the minus n, n, q 1 minus capital N, semicolon q n. I guess just to avoid confusion, this is what I mean here. Okay, that is the formula for the Carl Jones polynomial. This formula is terminating, so we can replace n minus n by infinity. And then decide to set capital N equal to zero. So since we use two different Qs, you should define Z. Z Thank you. Yeah, thank you. So let it's, now let's set n equal to 0 and call the, the, the formula, uh, now it's a formula, right? It's a formula, but it isn't a formula, it is still a not invariant. The fact that it's a not invariant is a theorem of actually Habiro. And this formula that looks like uh, uh, black magic, because yeah, I can rewrite the color Jones polynomial in many different ways. And if I just said n equals 0, in other words, in the zero dimensional representation, no, actually, it's not the zero dimensional representation. It's the infinite dimensional representation of SL2 of formal dimension 0. So if I do all that, then I'm going to get a not invariant, OK? And this so-called formula can, has two properties. First of all, it can be evaluated at nth roots of unity because only finitely many terms, right? And it can also be evaluated when q is e to the h bar. Oh, and why can it be evaluated when q is e to the h bar? Because because e to the h bar, e to the h bar n is n factorial h to the n plus O of h to the n plus 1. So in fact, it's not so hard to see that if you value, uh, so let's make now a definition. And the definition is, I use capital fees for perturbative, trivial. And of course, this is a formal power series with coefficients in h bar, rational coefficients because uh, of e to the h bar, and uh, Gevray 1. By the way, this series is not just a series. It is the series that um, we were calling Konsevich zagier series. And um, right, this expression. OK, so now let me give you a theorem. So it is every one. So what is the theorem? The theorem is, of course, that if you look in the Borel transform, so let us look at the Borel transform. This is Greek letter xi. When I write it, it looks like 7. But <laughs> what can you do, right? So this is the replacement of h to the n over n factorial by c to the n over uh, n minus. Topologically, it is a 7. And I'm Greek on top of everything. OK, <laughs> so, so this is the Borel transform, right? Borel transform convergent for xi near 0. So the theorem that we have with Ovidio Costin, which was the entry, this was my unofficial entry. It was 15 years ago, and it still is my agenda. 
Of course, to prove the volume conjecture, if you can prove resurgence itself, you prove much more. You prove generalized volume conjecture and other things. So you can aim for everything. I mean, that, that was my agenda. So we settled for something less. And here is a theorem. The theorem is that um, here's a formula, OK? Sum. Thank you, uh, Sergey. Epsilon n are the same numbers uh, n square pi square over 6 to the 5 half, where epsilon n are plus 1 if n is congruent to 1 or 7, uh, or 1 or 11. 5 or 7 and 0 otherwise. OK, so this is a formula. So in particular, it, it says that in Borel plane, the nearest singularity, the, all the singularities are in the real axis. The first one is in pi square over 6. The next one is in 25 pi square over 6 and, and, and keeps going. Right? They are not at all equally spaced. So this is part A. And let me also give you part B. So therefore, because the singularities are on the real axis, what we cannot do is Borel summation on the real axis. But we can do is Borel summation right before or after. Sorry, Laplace, uh, right before and, and, and right after. So we have a formula for that. That's a function of x now. And the formula is, it is i root 2 pi x to the 3 halves times sum epsilon n times n times q to the n square over 24 when n goes from 0 to infinity where q is e to the 2 pi i x. This is just the end of, of um, Sergei's talk, except I lied here. I should, have, I should have done one more thing. This is the Borel transform of f31 of e to the h after I multiply by e to the minus h over 24. I really need to multiply by that. That doesn't change anything. I mean, um, but it is much better for modular properties. So everything is explicit. And my challenge to you is to actually give a, a different proof of this theorem. So the proof of the theorem basically uses work of, of Don Zagier. Um, it follows from Zagier's work on the so-called strange identity. But this is a very explicit series with a very explicit formulas for everything. So if you, in fact, if you know the answer, please try to reproduce it. OK? It's just a baby case. Sorry, Maxim, to call that baby, but, <laughs> but. OK, so now let us grow up. If we may. <laughs> All right. After that comes the figure 8 knot. For which case the color Jones polynomial, I'm even going to give you the formula. I hope you appreciate the fact that these are formulas for the color Jones and not just for what's called the Kashaev invariant. n minus 1 q, n q to the minus n n. So therefore, the function that I was talking before um, of q is deceptively similar. It is q q n q inverse q inverse n from 0 to infinity. OK, and uh, we can talk about this is also uh, uh, Gevray 1. By the way, we have a little theorem with Tang Le, 
which says that this uh, is... It does look like it's a polynomial. Mm. This one? Should be 1 minus n, so no? Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. Sorry, uh, n minus 1 with the q inverse. Ah, okay. Yeah, 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 to terminate it. Thank you very much. And that's why I put q inverse here. A little theorem with Tangle is that for all nodes, this is Gevre 1. Okay. So you might say, well, but how different is this expression from th this expression? You know, surely if you prove resurgence of one, you can prove resurgence of the other. That is my challenge to you. So in fact, let me give you here a conjecture. So here is a conjecture stated for all nodes, right? The conjecture is that, so this thing I'm going to call it capital Phi trivial uh, of h bar for a node k. And the conjecture is that Phi trivial of a node k is resurgent in Borel plane. I mean, after you do Borel transform, with singularities at um, i times volume plus churn simons plus 4 pi squared times integers plus a little shift, this rk is a rational number. Um, and here rho is a parabolic SL2C representation. So that is a homomorphism of the familiar group into SL2C, which is parabolic. It means the trace of the meridian and the longitude is plus or minus one. Among all parabolic representations, there is one that everybody knows, namely the trivial representation. It is parabolic, I mean, and has zero volume and zero chain Simons. So, okay, this is a, a conjecture. So, RK doesn't depend on the representation? No, it doesn't. Yep, it's an overall shift. Okay. All right, so now. Two, three, four, five. Okay. <clears throat> so. Let me give you the, what happens in the case of the figure eight. Let me draw a picture for you. Robotic means around the knot is still important? Or? Yes, yes, uh, around the knot complement. I mean, the, the, the meridian and the longitude, yeah. So for the figure eight knot, we expect that First of all, the volume of the figure eight is about 2.02. Oh, oh, sorry, just do I understand this? If you run transcensor, it's really imagine a part of complex. Yes, yes, I could just call that complex chain Simons. That's right, that's right. Mm -hmm. So the complex, uh, well, there are, two, there are two parabolic representations, the geometric one, which gives the hyperbolic structure and the complex conjugate, um, so the geometric one has volume 2.02, the chern simons is zero. So therefore, if you plot the numbers, you find i times uh, v and minus i times v, where this distance is about two units. And then, and then there is the four pi square you know, here, which is um, 39.7, okay? And I didn't even draw it to scale. So therefore, we should, we, the singularities in Borel plane are supposed, of, of this, right, are supposed to line up in two horizontal lines And the singularities are sort of four pi square apart. 
Now you may say, and how do you know that they are all singularities and not, and not for instance, some of them are not? So the, our conjecture actually for the figure eight says that they are all, they are all going to be true singularities. And I'll give you evidence for that. Okay, <clears throat> so that's one conjecture. Now let me give you another conjecture. So is the shift zero in this case, or you just didn't write it? Zero. Well, if I put it here, it is zero, right? I really put them on the y-axis. OK, they're normal on shift. OK, so let's make a definition. Little, little phi trivial of a node k is going to be the evaluation at the kth root of unity. This is otherwise known as the Kashaif invariant of the knot. And it is a sequence of numbers. Yes, yes, it is a sequence of numbers. And uh, the conjecture is that this sequence of numbers is a resurgent function in Borel plane with those singularities. Okay, that's a conjecture. Okay, so for the figure eight, I gave you two series. I, I, I gave you this sequence and I gave you the other one, this one. So now let me give you a two by three matrix here. So first of all, just a few terms. So what is easy to compute here? Well, given that we have a formula and we substitute q equals z to the h and by terminating uh, sort of stuff, it is not so hard to find out that you get, you know, some terms here. But it is easy to compute these coefficients, which are factorial divergent. I should also say that it's another theorem of tongue and myself that this also, this series, uh, no, let's forget it. Okay. Now what about this? This is uh, e to the min, no, plus volume divided by to 2 pi divided by h bar. 1 over third fourth root of 3, you know, and then 1 plus, uh, there is a 2 pi i, there is an 11, there is a root 3, some trivial constant here, and the higher order terms. The reason I put this is um, to show a contrast. I meant geometric here, thank you. So the coefficients of this series are, uh, apart from the power of 2 pi i, which is homogeneous, they are supposed to be in the trace field of the knot, which for the case of um, the figure 8, it is q square root of minus 3. But they are supposed to be resurgent. So, in other words, so if we actually write down here e to the volume over 2 pi times 1 over h bar and call these coefficients here a n. So, these are easy to compute. These are much harder to compute. The only way to compute them is to compute the Kashaev invariant and then, in, and, and then uh, compute it to high precision and peel off the 1 over n, the 1 over n square term, and so on, and do the computation numerically, accelerate it using research on transform, and finally recognize it as an element of that trace field as an algebraic number. And we've done that uh, with Don Zagir, um, and we found out 100 terms in this series here, just uh, as, a, as a benchmark here. For this series, it's very easy to find uh, um, many terms. So, so we have 100 terms here. 
and there are other methods to compute the Kashaev invariant and, and main terms here. I should say also a little theorem. A little theorem here, actually it's joined with Don Zagir, is that the, Kash the Kashaev invariant of K is computable in linear time using the Q difference equation, OK? So it's a linear time computation, uh, yeah. But its asymptotics is not a linear time computation. So the question is, what are the asymptotics of, uh, so let's put this thing geometric here. And let's call these things trivial. What are the asymptotics of, a, of, of the nth coefficient here and the nth coefficient here? And if there is any justice in the world, the asymptotics of these coefficients are given in terms of themselves. Right. So let us define here. Um, OK, so let g of 1 to n be 1 over 2 pi i sum from 0 to infinity of a k anti n minus k minus 1 factorial divided by 2 i v to the n minus k. And uh, g21 is the same, except I replace here by minus 2 i v. OK, same. And, uh, and uh, G1n, which is root 2 over pi, sum of a k geometric, n minus k plus 3 halves factorial, divided by sort of i v to the n minus k plus 3 halves with uh, a k, yeah, that's it, that's it. Can you explain the notation? What is nt first, yeah. And t, what is in the denominator? Ah, yes, I didn't say that. Phi hat, the anti-geometric. So I said that there are three representations. I mean, there are three parabolic connections. The geometric, the anti-geometric. So the anti-geometric is the one that replace h by minus h. So we have three coefficients, the trivial, the geometric, and the anti-1, which is just minus 1 times the geometric. OK. And now I want to, well, tell you a theorem. Except I cannot tell you a theorem if it is not a theorem, right? So what is it? It is an empirical observation. And the empirical observation says that this is asymptotic to 3, g1 to n. The anti is asymptotic to minus 3, g2, 1, n. And that can be compressed into an skew-symmetric 2 by 2 matrix. And uh, finally, uh, the trivial one is asymptotic to G1n and G2n. So therefore, you get a matrix of this kind. OK. So in particular, to, to highest order, it says, for instance, that the, 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 the nth coefficient here is going to grow like 1 over 2 pi i, n minus 1 factorial, 1 over 2 i v to the n uh, times, uh, times a 0 
which is 1 over 4th root of 3. Okay, so by the way, how do we do this? So first of all, we use everything we have, namely 100 terms here. So the, the 100 terms is about e to the 365, just to give you an idea of the order of growth. Then uh, you take all the terms that you have here, you do the optimal truncation, so e to the 365 divided by this are two numbers of 365 digits. You take the ratio, you subtract one, and you find a, z a number which is e to the minus 115. So order dropped from 365 to minus 115. With these numbers here, okay? So they're pretty convincing. Sorry, but you have G1N and G2N? Yes, I didn't do G2N. So the G2 would be the other one, a 2 here, and the minus 1 here. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you may say that in Borel plane, uh, the asymptotic expansion of these ANs are basically uh, a expressed in terms of the series AN itself. Okay. Okay, so <clears throat> that's just the. But Stavros, why cannot you mm, transform this into a theorem by using the state integral representation? After all, these are so one dimensional integral. I'm not there yet. I'm only doing my. I'm, I'm just doing my first part of my talk. Right? Uh, I am still into. Uh, formal power series, I haven't done my analytic functions yet. So, just a third example, but very quickly, which is the 5, 2, naught. So, for the 5, 2, naught, let me give you the answer now, not of the Kashaev, because we, I mean, just of the Kashaev invariant, sorry. The answer looks like this. Okay, and you, although there is a denominator here because k is less than or equal to m, it always cancels with a little bit of the numerator and you have left both to expand when q is exponential of h bar and when q is a root of unity. So, in this case, the trace field is actually cubic, the only cubic field with discriminant plus, I mean, minus 23, the only one. And in this case, if we did the trivial, just uh, that would be easy. But if you did the geometric, you find 1 over 2i root 3 alpha minus 2, and then 1 minus 33 alpha square, and 2, 4, 2 alpha minus 2, 4, 5, over 4 times 23 square. There is an h, there is a 2 pi i times an h you know, bar and higher order terms. So this is, this field has one complex, I mean, one pair of complex embeddings and one real embedding, and I'm choosing here the complex embedding. The only reason I'm putting this is because Jan was asking what are the coefficients we're talking about, and the coefficients are in the trace field. And uh, conjecturally, every number field with at least one complex embedding is the trace field of some cusped hyperbolic manifold. Okay, so we computed 100 coefficients here, but we computed them using actually a kind of a num, I mean, sums. And I want to, to tell you the picture here, the analogous picture. So there are, there are three parabolic, I mean, other than the trivial representation, because this is a cubic field, it has three uh, embeddings in the complex numbers, 
and the geometric one is always parabolic, therefore so are the other two Galois conjugates, and uh, therefore we get here three numbers, v1, v3, v2. And as usual, there translates by 4 pi square. OK, and uh, the numbers are, can be given explicitly. One of them is manifestly real. This is actually an SL2R representation, because uh, we're talking about the real embedding here. And the other two are, are 1.379 plus or minus 2.828. That is the volume of, of, of the 5 to naught. And uh, you can actually check that this is nearly equilateral. Namely, the distance between V1 and V2 is 5.011. And the distance between these two is 5.656. The only reason I'm writing these numbers down is because they are given to us by the gods. They are not, you know, hyperbolic geometry normalizes the volume, normalizes geodesics, normalizes everything. It is not up to us to mess with these numbers. And in this case, we get uh, such a thing. So therefore, we're going to have a 3 by 4 matrix. And I will just tell you what are the, what is the analogous. I'm just going to cut the conversation down. And we computed the analogous um, matrix. We don. I should mention all these are joined with don, and the matrix now is zero, three, three, minus three, four. That's a three by three bit, and the other one is one one minus one. Okay, this is sort of the matrices that I believe uh, Sergey wanted. Um, <clears throat> Oh, and there is an additional shift, I should say. For the 5-2, there is a nasty kind of shift, which is a pi square over 6 that one has to put in there. OK, that was my the old part, which is, has to do about resurgence of sequences or factorially divergent series, with, with, which is mainly conjectural how to convert them into Borel plane and talk about analytic continuation. Why do you do that? Because after you convert to Borel plane, you take Laplace transform and then you're in, in, in the plane you want to be, in the plane where you have your analytic function, your solution to the difference or differential equation. But we don't have a difference or differential equation. But we do have a function. So my second part is about those functions. So part two, analytic, analytic functions of a variable tau. So tau is going to be mostly a variable in the cut plane. So it turns out that there are theories, uh, perhaps not full TQFTs, and they only work for cusp manifolds. These theories are called quantum Teichmiller theories or quantum hyperbolic geometry, and they always work for punctured Riemann surfaces and therefore cusp three manifolds, and they may be the wrong theories and so on, but they do give invariants of knots in particular. These theories were developed by Kashaev, um, Andersen and uh, uh, several uh, sort of other collaborators. And I want to focus that the building block for this state sums. Oh, I should say that for a general note, you might wonder how horrible does the formula look like. And the answer is not too bad. You're always doing a finite dimensional sum of ratios of quantum uh, factorials. That, that's all there is. 
And likewise, in this new theory, you're going to do not a finite dimensional sum, but a finite dimensional integral. And the building block is not going to be the quantum n factorial, but it's going to be a special function for Dave's quantum dialogarithm. <coughs> so let me give you an example. What is the answer for the figure 8 naught? So for every naught, oh, I should say here, first of all, theorem for every naught, there is a function which is analytic. Well, OK, you may say, uh, oh, well, you can take the constant function, I guess. But uh, I mean, there is a function which is analytic, which is uh, computed um, via ideal triangulations and uh, state integrals. Did I stop? You still have one blackboard left. No, I know, but my numbering got all messed up. Six is here, so seven, eight, nine. I learned this method from a, a, a young postdoc at MPI. Yeah, but you have to do it in advance. Otherwise, you, you get carried away. <laughs> OK, so what is the invariant for the figure 8? It is the integral of phi b x squared e to the minus pi i x squared dx, where phi b is um, a very special function, very special function. I can write down the formula. But the formula will not really talk to you unless you have played with it. Bz, hyperbolic sine, b inverse z, dz over z. OK, so this is for devs quantum dialogarithm. And it is a very it's uh, doubly quasi-periodic, and it has uh, all kinds of properties. So this is the invariant. Now you may say, hmm, OK, so this is an invariant. It's an analytic function. So what can I get out of this? Um, here is a theorem um, with Rinat Kashaev. You can think of this function as follows. So if tau is in the upper half plane, <coughs> what is the dispedance uh, on tau? Ah, thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> so if, um, if um, tau is in the upper half plane, then up to a silly factor, which I will just skip, although it's record. Well, you know what? I don't even need to skip. 24, and then 1 over root tau little g times big G minus root tau big G little g, where little g is sum minus 1 it's a specific kind of num sum. And big G is the same, except you multiply by 6n plus 1. One minus seven Q minus fourteen Q square, and and so on. Okay? So in other words, our uh, our invariant is a combination of Q series and Q tilde series. These series, much like uh, the series uh, in Sergei's talk, are only defined inside the unit disk. And they, of course, have um, divergent expansions at uh, one or at any cusp, any rational, any root of unity. And we have proven the existence of asymptotic expansions uh, 
uh, around every cusp with Don. This is not totally trivial. And uh, of course, the conjecture is that these asymptotic expansions at every cusp are resurgent, but uh, we don't uh, touch that. But it is a conjecture. But the amazing thing is that although both little g and big G are divergent as, as tau approaches uh, uh, a specific uh, number, let's say, in the positive reals, their combination extends uh, in the cut plane. OK? So, OK. So now I need to connect the asymptotics of the little g and the big g with the invariance that I was telling you about. So maybe you can say how q is related to tau and q. Ah, thank you. I didn't say. q is e to the 2 pi i tau and q tilde is e to the minus 2 pi i over tau, just as in modular forms. So asymptotic expansions of little g and big g, let's say at 1. OK, and uh, that is a theorem. So let me call little w. So notice that my functions are not just power series in q, they are also in q tilde. And not only in q and q tilde, but they have polynomial actual square root behavior in tau. So they are not just pure q series. Sorry about that. But that's life. <clears throat> so we talk about this big G little uh, q tilde here. And capital, the i over 2, same expression, but with a minus sign. Then, uh, then, when tau is e to the i theta over n, and n goes to infinity, w is asymptotic to the geometric series. And big W is asymptotic to the anti-geometric, except that these series are multiplied by G of Q tilde and big G of Q tilde. And uh, keep in mind that these are instanton corrections. OK? And uh, that is actually a theorem with Don Zagier. And something different happens. So this happens, by the way, when theta is between 0 and pi over 2. And something different happens when theta is between pi over 2 and pi. To actually explain what happens, I want to draw for you the walls and the crossing of the walls. So we have this, and we have this, and so on. Question. This is a, a tiny angle, but how tiny is it? And the answer is, uh, O point O three two times pi. Okay, so in this sector, you see that this series is asymptotic to this formal power series in tau, with no corrections. When you jump in across, you see the first power of Q tilde. When you jump it again, you see the second power. And again, and again, and again. So how far can you keep jumping to see the, the powers to eventually, so you know, to actually uh, see the first coefficient here, you have to be 
very near, I mean, your tau has to be near the real axis. So I want to give you some numerical data now. And then I will end by connecting the formal power series to these two functions. So numerics. Let's take tau to be 150 plus i, so that's very near, but scaled down to 2,500,000. ,000. So the imaginary part is 1.3 e to the minus 6. So according to that, we should actually see about four coefficients of this Q tilde series. So in other words, these Stokes constants, or however you want to call these uh, symbols, maybe these Voros symbols have integer coefficients. So the trivial. So we're going to take all our 100 terms that we have. And uh, here is the function. Ooh. The function, and here is the size. So the size is 234. If you take little w of tau, you find 234, just uh, size-wise, right, digit-wise. If you take this, you get minus 232. The q tilde itself is e to the minus 29. If you take the trivial one, sorry, the geometric, I meant, geometric, and divide by little w and subtract 1, you are dividing these two large numbers minus 1, and you find 0 to 192 digits. And if you do it for the other one, here the anti-geometric capital W, with the corrections, um, you find minus 192. And why can't you go further than 192? Because you only used 100 terms of this series, and I used them to the optimal truncation. So every one of these factorial divergent series has an internal error, which is only exponentially small, but you can't go beyond. And here we reach the bottom of the error, and we found all, all the nine terms here, and then we repeated the experiment, and, and so on and so forth. So, OK, so what this is saying is that the little g and uh, so these analytic functions, this is the state integral, and this is the anti-state, because it replaces tau by minus tau. These functions can reproduce the trans series. How about? using the trans series to reproduce the functions. So if you actually plug in the asymptotics of these w's uh, here, and you go back to the state integral, you're going to find something funny. And that's going to be the last thing that I want to, to talk about. And the funny thing is, That, yeah. Um, OK. So converse, how to reconstruct the state integral from this uh, series, factorially divergent, right? So take this expression, e to the minus volume over 4 pi this uh, series here, I, I remove the exponentially large term because I put it here anyhow. So 2x, 1 minus x, phi geometric of minus 2x over 1 plus x, minus e to the volume over 2 pi, over 2 pi, actually pi. The geometric one. Uh, 2x over 1 plus x, 
and the geometric of minus 2x over 1 minus x. OK, so this is a series, right? Uh, this is a power series in x with constant coefficient that and that and whatever the constant term is here. Yep, yep. So this series is not factorially divergent. It has a radius of convergence equals 1. And in fact, it is equal to the state integral of tau when tau is 1 plus 1 minus x, well, 1 plus 2x over 1 minus x. OK? Combinations of products, bilinear products, of factorial divergent series is convergent. And to explain that, let me say that the coefficient here of this series the coefficient of x to the 140 is e to the 260. But after you multiply them out, the coefficient in this product of x to the 140 is 0 0.0141. OK. So I'll stop here. Yeah. What is the origin of this change of variables? Just to ma ma make them circle, yeah. avoid singularities. Ah, yeah. So, 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 uh, so this the state integral is uh, uh, has an essential singularity at i equals zero, which are these series. What I do is I expand it at tau equal one. So how do I expand tau equal one? I can set one plus epsilon, but just uh, to center things better, I send it like that, where x is near 0. And then, if, if I do that, then my radius of convergence is going to be 1. So full reconstruction of the, of, of the Laplace tr transform uh, bypassing the Borel plane. I still don't know why these are singularities. Any more questions? Yeah. By uh, pure curiosity, do you uh, have any control, numerical or analytical, on the growth at infinity of the Borel trans in the Borel plane of the functions? Uh, how tame are they? Yeah. Uh, yeah, they are exponentially growing. Yeah, they're exponentially growing. Mm -hmm. Well, actually, as you well know, there's been a PhD of the, uh, in the case of Fulker mm -hmm. Mott that elucidates in minute detail all the resurging aspects. I think uh, you... Uh, that's, uh, yes. Uh, now, Whether 4 pi square, for instance, is a singularity. Oh, I should tell you that. So using, so Marcos Marino had uh, four, 20 terms of this series. And then we, he did a Padet approximation in the complex plane to locate the singularities. And he found one singularity here, kind of, and then, and then kind of a cloud that wasn't conclusive. And then we tried with 100 terms, and we found another one here with some sigma. I don't know many, how many sigmas. Uh, but whether 4 pi square is a singularity, and whether this statement is true, that goes beyond the thesis of Shveta's Sharma. That did not exist 15 years ago when I visited you. This is new stuff. Yeah, but the, um, the PhD came after that. Yeah. And uh, it's not a question of finding the uh, like, uh, syntactic equivalent, actually. Uh, uh, given that you know uh, the exact uh, syntactic structure of the Taylor coefficients, you can uh, get uh, uh, not only the location of the next singularity, but actually the exact Taylor expansion. It's not too many. The nearest one, yes. 
No, no, but, but they, all the others can be. There is a trick, which uh, is called the ping pong. The ping pong that I know it, it involves only the two nearest singularities, or in this case... No, no, it doesn't. There, uh, there is a trick that can uh, yeah. take you anywhere. If you think you have the ping pong game at hand, I suggest to try this into the Konsevich series that is actually missing a lot of singularities. So, so, so. In, this, in the case yeah. of uh, um, figure eight, and actually it is mentioned at the introduction of the uh, PhD that um, the method in theory extends to all knots, but we are not interested in that. But um, uh, there is an extension in another direction mm -hmm. for all power series with exactly the same syntax, let us say. So in a sense, it is uh, less and more general than mm -hmm. the, um, conjecture, the, the volume uh, conjecture. But actually, there's a full picture. The, uh, and to come back to Voro's question, in the, indeed, there is exponential, uh, uh, at most, you know, exponential uh, um, uh, growth at infinity on the uh, normal rays. So uh, there, there's no, uh, it's not a matter of conjecture, it's a, it's a, it's a uh, dumb thing. I will write, since you challenged me, <laughs> I will write this. OK. Remove these numerics. So the state integral, this i for 1 of tau, can be written uh, uh, because of this combination of series in the following way. And this, by the way, uh, if Carlos asks, they are absolutely convergent and in fact with analytic expansion. So here is the formula for the hundredth instant on term. Seven, seven, five, six, nine, seven, I over root tau G minus root tau eight, seven, three, zero, four, eight, two, two, zero, eight, two, five, three, six, three, big G of Q. That's the 500 instant, instant on term. If you can reproduce these numbers, whatever black magic or box you use, please let me know. But I don't think that you can reproduce these numbers because it's one thing to talk about, I think, a general theory versus specific values of Stokes constants and specific functions. But uh, maybe I'm wrong. So this is my challenge. Well, actually, the arithmetical nature of the uh, Taylor coefficients is totally irrelevant in, the, in that case. It okay. might be, uh, you might be obsessed by this, but actually it's not, uh, as far as resurgence is concerned, it is, uh, uh, yeah. it is totally, it, it has nothing to do with it. Yeah, but parabolic flat connections have geometric origin. And even those constants, like the volume, have geometric origin. Fine, but th then... Uh, I, I mean... You <laughs> know. No, but our argument was only about the, the status of the theory. Yeah, yeah. Is it a conjecture or is it not? And what I was saying this is uh, established. Okay. Okay. Well, you're, you're welcome to your opinion. Any more questions? No. Let's say uh, thanks. Okay. Good.